Well, hello and welcome to this showcase of Century and High Performance Learning in Doha College. Uh, it's great to see so many attendees here from across the world and both those of you who know about High Performance Learning and Century and those who don't. Uh, this session will hopefully provide a great introduction to both Century and HPL uh, for those that are new to them, but also give those who are more familiar some ideas and examples from inside the classrooms of a world-class school, which might prompt ideas for how you can use them in your own classrooms. Doha College was the first school to be accredited with world-class status by HPL, and they continually strive to embed the HPL framework in their school and use Century's AI technology to tailor the learning of each student. Indeed, the partnership of Century and HPL came about from the great success that Doha College had in using the two as mutually beneficial ways of increasing their students' performance. And I'm delighted that we're joined by Dr. Stefan Sommer, the principal of Doha College, who is gonna discuss how his school has implemented these. After the fireside chat with Stefan, we will have two short presentations from Chris Watson and Shabby Bashir, who are gonna share examples from their classrooms of Century and HPL in action. Now, if you have any questions for our speakers throughout this, please do use the chat function to ask these, and we will collate them for a Q&A at the end of the session. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Charles, who is joined at the fireside by Stefan. Many thanks for that introduction, Luke, and a, a very warm welcome to all our attendees today. It's, uh, it's absolutely fantastic to see the, the range of uh, countries that are here today. I've, I've seen Nigeria, Spain, uh, the UAE, lots from Qatar, of course, um, and even West Yorkshire. So a very warm welcome to you all. Please continue to use the, the chat functionality to, to comment. Uh, and there is a Q&A box to ask questions. Um, but to the show, I am absolutely thrilled to have uh, the principal of, of Doha College with us today. Stefan, uh, a very warm welcome to you. Um, Thank and you, Charles. It's it's great to to have you open this and and uh, as we explore how Doha College has has taken advantage of of Century Tech and high performance learning. Now I've known you for a few years, um, but of course you have had an extensive career as as a head teacher from from the UK to France to the Netherlands, Switzerland, um, and and now of course Qatar. Um, I wonder if if to start us off, arriving in in Doha in 2015 uh, with with that breadth of experience behind you that must have set you up for, um, uh, I guess, visualizing what excellence would look like at Doha College. So I wonder if you could perhaps walk us through that initial process from when you first arrived at, in, in Qatar. Um, and and you know, did you have a well-refined playbook that you could simply turn to and then apply to the setting in Doha College? Well, um, thank you, Charles. Uh, well, no, I didn't have a playbook. I had, a, I had an idea because we mustn't forget schools and, you know, my um, fellow colleagues who are heads of other schools will know that full well. Schools are organisms and uh, schools are individual organisms. So what you've done in one school, you can't easily just uh, superimpose into another. However, the experience of having run three successful schools in Europe sort of sharpened my mind on the A, the kind of things that are possible, what can be done. Uh, it also sharpened my mind uh, on what works and in what kind of circumstances. But it also sharpened my mind on researching of um, the exact conditions of whether or not certain things are actually needed in one school. I have never uh, thought that a principal coming in new to a school with clearly a brief from the board or the owner or whatever the um, the constitutional setup of the uh, of, of the school is can actually just do what he or she thinks needs to be done now because a school is an organism it comes within um, it has staff it has students and parents so um, whatever you do needs to be you need to take everybody along uh, and that's why Century Tech and, uh, and High Performance Learning are such good examples. And yes, uh, I uh, when I came to do a college, I had a firm view of what uh, ideally um, uh, I would like to see happening. But we mustn't forget, uh, Doha College was a very successful school when I arrived here. It had been well run. It had a fantastic reputation. Um, so I, um, you know, I could have taken the view. Actually, there's very little that, little that needs doing. But uh, what is important to bear in mind is 
that the conditions in Qatar um, were quite fluid at the time and changed massively because, you know, uh, 41 years ago when Doha College was founded, Qatar was a very different place. And uh, it is now, it has been catapulted into the 21st century very quickly now that it's getting ready for the World Cup. So the uh, what was needed was different. And we tried with the staff, with the students, but also with the parents as a community as a whole to kind of uh, define the, uh, the, the future from 2015 when I first came here forward together. Fantastic. And I mean, you already alluded and touched upon the idea of, um, I guess, looking for key partners that that help you with that. And, and of course, um, I suppose building a strong strategy starts with understanding what it is you're trying to achieve. Lots, lots of people often confuse strategy with, with goals. Um, but once you have your goals and your, your vision, your endpoint, um, navigating that strategy, of course, includes partners, whether that's technology partners, pedagogy partners, uh, hardware partners. Um, are there yeah. specific things that you look for within your partners um, you know, when considering who you want to work with? Uh, do you have a criteria yeah. or things that you yeah, look out for? We do. Uh, and of course, these criteria don't really change because the criteria um, have to be defined in the context of the school. And uh, again, coming back to what I said before, that schools are organisms and you need to see, and you're using the right word there, you, who you can partner with uh, to achieve what you want to achieve. And that depends on the kind of company it is, the kind of customer uh, service they have, uh, the way they draw you into what they are doing and you are part of what they're doing. Uh, we are teachers and I've part of my vision and my mission throughout my life as a head uh, has always been to um, never forget that we are teachers and with it learners and that we can't ever be seen by our students or parents as being unable to learn because that almost disqualifies us from being in the uh, in the job that we that we are doing here um, so therefore it's always to me it's always very important that the partnership is such that we can learn from the company that offers the service but we also feel that we can give something to the company, which they can then spread further in order to make the product and service uh, better. And yes, and we, we've had a few. Uh, don't forget, I, uh, Doha College was already an iPad school when I first came. So IT was, was pretty big, but you know, we've only just built a new campus. We've moved into a new campus, which is really a 21st century, well, second decade of the 21st century um, facility, really quite, quite amazing, um, but, um, the needs of that kind of facility for the next 15, 20 years at Doha College are very different from what we used to have. And of course, we've capitalized on what we learned in the first few years that we did. And we were one of the first schools that had a one-to-one a, a -one device policy where every student had a uh, an iPad with them, uh, which was given to them by the school. Sorry, we are a school after all. So it uh, was given to them by the school. And it's part, uh, it's, it's part of their journey it's part of their learning and they take it home, they take it on holiday in order to enable them to learn anywhere in any way. Um, and uh, and that was then further ex further expanded and to, into VLEs that we now have. We didn't have at the time, but now we do. I, I think that's so important, that symbiotic relationship. And I think it is symbiotic that, um, you know, we want to learn from our schools as well. And that's why the word partnership is, is incredibly important to us. There's no point in us building products that, don't fit the purpose for what you're trying to achieve. And so often a lot of what we do build is informed by feedback that we get from, from working closely with our schools. And I'm gonna put you a bit on the spot here, um, but you have raised something which is, is a fantastic opportunity for me to hear. Um, you know, when looking at Sentry or, or high performance learning, were there specific things that stood out in terms of, of what you could learn from our respective areas of, of expertise? Well, it's, uh, you, you know, it's, uh, I mean, we, um... And we adopted uh, Century Tech uh, uh, because obviously I'm, I'm, I'm very closely linked to Cobis. And I remember well, uh, my first exposure to Century Tech was when I heard Priya speak there. And I was so enamored with what she said. She said, well, if that is what they do, that's exactly what we need. And that's when I then started, that's when we got, uh, got in touch with each other because I then researched further uh, through Priya of, uh, of what it is that you do. And the more I understood that, uh, what you do, the more I realize that actually you are, um, um, in fact, a perfect tool 
um, to enhance what high performance learning does as a philosophy. And that is the philosophy we have adopted here in, uh, uh, in Dewa College, which has had tremendous success in an already uh, very, uh, very good school and has actually conditioned our students in such a way that they could also do well uh, in this period of blended and remote learning uh, just now. But um, and, uh, and I thought, well, actually, this is a, a it, not only do century tech and high performance learning complement each other, it always, almost comes as a perfect package because all the skills that are taught through the philosophy of high performance learning are reinforced by learning independently in the way you learn using century tech. And that's another thing, the reason why we've been very successful in this pandemic, uh, and the Delta is uh, is positive, actually, it's, it's quite extraordinary, um, is also because the independence that has been, that our, our the independent learning capacities that our children have uh, developed by being us being a high-performance learning school and instilling those skills, have uh, been reinforced by Century and what what the what the AI facility has done is it enabled our students to actually uh, focus on connection finding to use what they've already learned and then through very clever yes computer generated but very clever questioning um, lead them towards the correct answers while them going through their own thinking process, therefore uh, putting in motion their own uh, sort of convolutions in the brain and developing further pathways. I mean, there's no better way of developing intellect in um, uh, in children. And uh, this is just, it's worked fantastically well for us. It's and it's a, it's a brilliant symbiosis. That's great to end. And um, I mean, I, I was going to touch upon this anyway. Um, the, the pandemic, the, the last 15 months has, uh, I guess, turned many worlds upside down, um, but also highlights the importance of a robust education system so that learning can continue. And I mean, hats off to everyone who, who works in education, from, yeah. from providers to teachers, that they've performed phenomenally to ensure learning has continued. Um, now, I suppose I'm a natural optimist and, and think that actually teachers, schools, policymakers, education as a whole will benefit from what has occurred um, over the past 15 months in terms of upskilling innovation that's occurred, but also the spotlight that is, is now on education. Um, I wonder if you could share perhaps you know, what has the pandemic taught you, your school, um, about roadmaps for, for excellence or and, and I suppose how has it impacted your journey and your trajectory in terms of what you're doing? It it has well a um, it's uh, been of course a, a trauma certainly at the beginning it was a trauma for us because we were literally closed from one day to the next um, and as many schools around the globe were um, with the uh, with the pandemic but uh, having already had iPads having already had a VLE having already had uh, having already instilled in the students the uh, the notion of retrieving. Uh, work from the VLE and uploading work to be marked on the VLE. So a lot of this, these capacity abilities were already there and well developed. What was the shock was all of a sudden it wasn't just what teacher A, teacher B, or teacher C said. That's what you've got to do for tomorrow or the next or the next day. Now that's all there. That everything needs to be happening on that, and that of course uh, required quite a level of modification. And uh, and all of that, and I'm very grateful to uh, to the staff, to my staff here at, at Dewa College, who did that exceptionally well at speed, as they would have done in other schools uh, too, um, uh, to adapt all planning. Which of course, most teachers are very good planners, and all of that is, has been planned. So what's been planned for the day literally needs to be changed and needs to be changed going forward. Because although, of course, the content when we went to remote learning had to be the same, but obviously the mode of delivery was a very different one, and it's a fallacy to believe. Well, actually, it's just the same you just do it online but it's uh, it's a different thing and what now rolls off um uh, quite naturally on a daily basis yes that's our after 18 months that, that wasn't quite like that on day one it was still a bit halting and uh, uh, some teachers were more diffident than others it's just a bit it is a, it was not as easy to all as it as it as it comes to as, as it comes to some and that but all schools will have had that situation but uh, the, um, uh, the important thing is that students and staff already had the base skills to actually very quickly and literally within a week or two get used to what they do every now and again 
doing it uh, doing it all the time. The learning curve to us it's been huge. Uh, for us, the notion of of blended of doing certain things online, be it parents meetings, be it setting of course setting of work that was done that was done before it, uh, as well. But having children take part in remote lessons that will be researched going forward how this can be done. For instance, every year that will be the same in other schools in Qatar and around the world. When for instance students leave because their parents' jobs change and they leave in year ten, this is a two year course and that's quite difficult. And often we are getting asked, oh, if only we could stay for the last for the last year to be so difficult to find the right school the right fit for that that will now be explored because that is now possible because they're of course well integrated in this community they know this community they know the teachers and therefore it is now possible to just do um, a, you know either a term or indeed a, a full year online knowing how the systems work and, and, and that, that kind of thing but it will um we will find other um, um uh, other opportunities to use the skills that we've uh, that we've developed uh, as well as an education system, I think um, it's uh, the pandemic will never be forgotten, and I hope that policymakers will bear in mind the drama we've gone through with the CAGs, because what we mustn't forget, and of course, um, I haven't said that here, but many who know me know that I wasn't educated uh, in the UK only. I was also educated in Russia and in, um, in Germany and in France. So I know how other education systems work. And I've always thought it was a rather missed opportunity that in the UK, uh, everything depends on a final exam, however well or badly you might have done in the year, which of course in other education systems, that's not the case. There is a percentage of what you achieve in the end that is accounted, that is drawn from the, your achievement uh, throughout the year or throughout the course in class. And that's something I know um, from talks I've had with their examination boards that going forward they will do, which would um, a future pandemic, dare I say it, make it easier because at least students and staff are used to work happening in class being used as uh, to produce a final grade, which of course in the UK nobody had, even the parent generation were never used to uh, the year's worth of work in class to to be used as an exam grade, so it's uh, so that would be another thing that I would quite like to see um, going uh, going forward. But as I said, um, um, and I just want to say this as, as a final thing: all crises uh, bring uh, encourage innovation because there's a reason why in English we say you know um, um, that um, you know necessity is the mother of invention and in a crisis there are necessities that we don't normally have so all of a sudden we come with all of these ideas what else we can do and i think there's a lot more that we will see and i have very high hopes and knowing you in century tech that you will come up with a with a lot more a, a lot more goods there and i'm sure going forward um uh, this the use of ai in channeling students' capacity for learning, not only the content that they take in, but how they learn and how they uh, use their own ability of what they've learned before in order to develop new, uh, new knowledge, that is actually a much more necessary skill than the actual knowledge that you have, because what you learn today might be wrong tomorrow anyway, but the skill of getting to that new knowledge on the basis of what you learned before is one that will be in a um, you know, faster and faster changing society when there are jobs around that we don't even know what they are, that will be a skill that is very, very much needed in the future. Well, you've, you've touched upon so many fantastic things. I've, I've got all these uh, uh, bullets noted down. I mean, I, I love the concept of, of breaking down barriers between um, learning in school and, and learning at home and, and learning with your family. And I think if we can have some sort of triangulation between that, that, that allows for that learning to continue no matter where you are, no matter what setting you are in, not only being able to understand the connections between the learning processes and the learning um, uh, progression lines, um, but also I love, you know, and you know we are strong advocates of a more formative approach to assessment, a continuous approach throughout the academic year, and of course things like Century and, and the HPL framework really lend itself to that. We're, we're out of time, but I do have one final question for you, Steph. And, um, you know, you, you've, you've yeah. described this fantastic journey and, and um, you know, you've navigated the pandemic uh, expertly. What's next? You're in your, your seventh year now at, at Doha College. What is what is next and what yes. could you be doing better? Well, there's a, there, there's, there, there's a lot to do. We, uh, we have just uh, completed our 
second cycle of three-year development plans uh, while I've been here. The third one, we're starting the work on it in January 2022 for it to be kicked off in September 2022. Um, and there are big things, big ticket items on the agenda. We also mustn't forget, um, we moved school, a very, very highly successful school after 40 years uh, to a different site. Uh, we are more popular than we ever were. We are fuller than we ever were. And we are bigger than we ever were. Um, and that's great to have that we've uh, retained the popularity. Our results are better than they ever were. And they have been even before the pandemic. Um, and uh, Century Tech as well as HPL helped immensely in that because as I said before, the students have adopted a, a much more independent way of learning and much more um, uh, and a much more yielding uh, way of learning. But there's work to do. For instance, uh, we had 40 year old roots, which we cut off in order to move this whole campus, this whole school to a different location. And yes, we are putting down roots, but we mustn't forget we had a glitzy new campus, but actually none of my teachers have ever seen it full of people because it was one day on, one day off. We only have had half the children here. There are all the well-being problems that of course the pandemic has caused in, in Doha College as well as in all other schools. So that needs that needs a completely new strategy on how we're dealing with that, both in students and staff and to a degree also in, uh, in parents. In a way, the heart of our community has been uh, has been ripped out a bit as it is in, in all schools because uh, we thrived on being together doing things together cooperating and collaborating and all of that was all of a sudden illegal so we couldn't do that anymore we had to keep our distance couldn't stay in the same room uh, for long enough and all of that needs to be regenerated so that that culture needs to be recreated and that is a that will be a big focal point and a big a big job but you know, the strategies that we, the long-term strategies that we've taken with high performance learning and, uh, and century tech, uh, we are hoping, and that I'm coming back to your very first question, Charles, and that is the, the partnership. That is what I value so much because I know that both in century tech and in high performance learning that have been so instrumental in, uh, in our getting to where we are at the moment are flexible enough to also learn with us what's now next. We know that we will have a say like other schools. We will contribute to that. So you grow with the knowledge that we've, um, uh, that we've contributed and we grow with your expertise that you've contributed and, uh, and sort of uh, conserved in, uh, in, in the AI um, uh, system that you created with Century Tech. Oh, I mean, Stefan, thank you so much. And, and you know, I think you've painted a, a, a clear picture of hope and, and light, and I'm, I'm sure you'll continue watering those roots and tending to those roots. And we're, we're really excited to see where it takes us all. So um, Dr. Stefan Summer, thank you very much for um, being at my virtual fireside chat today. Um, I, it's been a pleasure as always. Um, we're now moving over to um, the two presentations for the day, um, and I'm really delighted to introduce Chris Watson um, from Doha College, who will be talking about the HPL framework at Doha College, and Chris will be followed by Shabi Bashir, uh, who will be talking about Century Tech uh, at Doha College. So really um, great insights to, to show you how those specific tools, frameworks are actually utilized in a practical sense. Um, Again, can't stress enough, please ask questions. It's a fantastic opportunity to speak to people firsthand um, about their experiences. So keep the questions coming um, and I will join you later to uh, address those questions to our panelists. Um, but over to you, Chris, um, thank you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, I'll just share my screen now. Can everyone see the screen I'm sharing, yeah? Yes. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, firstly, thank you for the opportunity to come and share the, the, my fantastic experience at Doha College with high performance learning. The picture I've chosen to start with here to emphasise what high performance learning is like at Doha College is this one here because it shows our community moving forward together. And great schools do that, don't they? They move forward as one community. And that's been the, at the heart of our success in terms of adopting the high performance learning framework. The aims of, of what I'm going to share are to share who we are at DC and where we started with HPL, to share what it looks like in action at Doha College, but then also to, to share a little window into how we're maintaining momentum and where we will go next with high performance learning. So about us, uh, Doha College is obviously based in Qatar. Uh, it's a three to 18, it's a through school. So we have both the, the preschool, uh, primary and uh, secondary context. We're a national curriculum, we follow the national curriculum for England, and obviously we offer uh, GCSE and A-level. We have over 2,000 students, and as Stefan said, we were established in 1980, and important to note that we're also a non-for-profit school. 
some of our recent achievements, of course, uh, we were the first school to be awarded with the HPL accreditation in June. Uh, we were also the first school in Qatar to be accredited under the new COBUS Patrons Accreditation and Compliance Scheme. We have consistently outstanding exam results from the last formal exam period outside of the CAG process. We posted record results in 2019. And I think what one of the, the things with that is that our results across the school are steadily improving as we go deeper into our journey with high performance learning. But of course, we are a, an exceptional academic school, but it's the way that we get those results that makes DC particularly unique because we offer extensive enrichment programs with over 170 different uh, activities on offer for our students. And of course, uh, as Stefan alluded to, we are a fully digital school with one-to-one -one devices from key stage through to throughout the rest of the school. But I thought it would be a good place to start to sort of give a brief in a nutshell of what high performance learning actually is. So I've tried to be succinct with that. Uh, high performance learning is about high academic performance being attainable for everyone. It's about the many, not the few, achieving outstanding results. It's about using the latest science that we have from cognitive science, from educational research to understand that when we work in the right way with our students, we can actually help them to build better brains. We can help them to, we can actually grow their intelligence. And linked to that is about teaching children the cognitive skills and the behavioral skills in order uh, to allow them to be successful in learning, in work, and in life. And I think where we started with this, the, the formula for high performance uh, for success is there on the board, but the picture really illustrates the, the, the mirror mirror on the wall, because when you start with your HPL journey as we did, you need an honest reflection of where you are. What are you good at already? Because high performance learning framework is for schools that are already outstanding. What are you already doing that's really you know, in line with the high performance learning framework? but a really honest reflection of what is it you need to improve on? How can you use the framework to enhance the provision that you have for your students? And I think uh, this quote with, with Dylan William really resonated with me. Everything works somewhere and nothing works everywhere. So when we took the high performance learning framework on board, it was really about making solutions unique for our context, the environment we work in with the task of high performance learning delivering outstanding learning and the individuals within our context. So when we reflected, what was our focus? Well, we had to have an honest reflection on where we actually enabling high performance for all of our students, or where we running with gifted and talented style programs that uh, actually enabled success for the few, not the many. Were we really engaging our parents on our journey? Were we really bringing them along with opening the doors of the school and letting them see how they can be co-partners in shaping their child's educational journey? Were we placing inquiry-based learning at the heart of our learning experiences? Were we allowing children to ask questions and then facilitating the answers to those questions and allowing them the space and opportunity to find out for themselves? And crucially, were we equipping our learners with the behaviors for how to be successful and the thinking skills for how to be successful? And actually, on our reflection, these were the pillars that we started with. Uh, in terms of moving forward. But how did we go about driving that change? Well, the first thing is we had strategic guidance from Stefan. It was really clear to all of us in the school that high performance learning and the implementation of that was a priority for us. It was something that was being prioritized and time was dedicated at collegiate time for staff meeting, as well as quality assurance processes designed to, to allow us to, to share best practice. But I go back to the bespoke solutions. It was about having a shared common understanding about what high performance learning looked like and what we we're trying to achieve, but allowing our teaching teams to be active, active problem solvers, allowing them to interpret the framework and come up with solutions that were bespoke for them. It was about staff sessions. It was about having teaching and learning forums. It was about team meetings. It was about high performance learning suffusing and permeating the entire school community. And I think this quote from Dublin Mauve in his Reading Rediscovered, uh, it really summarizes what we were trying to achieve, although it's specific for reading. He says, low readers are often balkanized to reading only lower level texts, fed on a diet of only what's accessible to them, consigned to lower standards from the outset by our very efforts to help them. And that resonated with me particularly because at the implementation point of high performance learning, I was ahead of year in year six and we set for maths. And the challenge for us was we had 
really fantastic results when we set for maths. And it was about reflecting and seeing, are we getting these results in the right way? And that led to some really honest feedback for us. So we moved to a model that was more underpinned by whole class teaching. We use the phrase, it's about equity, not equality. It's about making sure every learner has the scaffolding to access the content rather than dumbing the content down for, for them to access. So we looked at guided reading, whole class guided reading, which I'll exemplify uh, in a second. We looked at maths mastery, moving to whole class models of, of teaching for that. And we looked at effective collaboration, how we activated uh, our inquiry-based learning experiences, but also our everyday classroom experiences to make sure that we were underpinned by the principles of assessment for learning and that we were activating students as instructional tools for each other. But all of this was underpinned by some very sophisticated techniques that was really developed from cognitive load theory, all of those sorts of things that we're, we're talking about a lot in, in teaching and education just now. So we looked at pre-teaching. We never sent children in cold. One of our equity strategies was about identifying students who would find content hard and making sure that we reduce their cognitive load by pre-exposure to materials and also the development of prerequisite skills. An example of that, of course, is uh, equivalent fractions. Uh, you can't do equivalent fractions if you can't find common factors. So making sure that we had the precursors in place. It was about dynamic differentiation. Uh, of course, we had to be able to target, we have to be able to target students who are finding things hard in a lesson and support them and scaffold them to be able to uh, achieve success in the day and obtain a high success rate within the practice of the day. But we didn't prejudge that. We used hinge question and we used our episodic teaching in order to be able to target uh, episodes uh, of, of support at the right time. And of course, it was about targeted intelligent intervention, time limited intervention to allow students to fill fundamental gaps that they may have in the, in the learning. What does that look like for reading though? So in terms of reading, of course, there's a strong focus on the cognitive skills required for reading. So in terms of those cognitive domains, three of the big ones for us were recall, inference and choice in terms of the author's choice. So we embedded that into every single lesson that we taught for whole class guided reading. We also looked at uh, whole class texts that were engaging, that allowed us to engage the maximum amount of readers. And we also looked at uh, pure thinking skills within reading. So the example at the side here, the strategies for understanding, were taken from a woman from the University of Strathclyde, Sue Ellis did a literature review and picked out the 10 top metacognitive strategies that consistently across the research literature came back as being particularly effective. So we supported our students in terms of developing metacognition because we made explicit the strategies that we were teaching them if they weren't understanding the text. And of course, the picture of the young man uh, and lady sitting here on World Book Day reading is because what we can never forget is the outcome. High performance learning is about lifelong, life-wide engagement with learning and created, creating a love of reading is fundamentally what we want to do when we're, we're undertaking our reading lessons. We have looked at inquiry-based learning and I think at its heart, the, the picture of the young lady here is at, at uh, the National Museum for Qatar. And fundamentally, inquiry-based learning is about allowing children the space and time to ask questions and supporting them in finding those answers. It's about generating that sense of wonder in learning that we should always be engendering within our students. Two of the practical examples here, the one at the bottom right, uh, I'm happy to say that our health and safety officer signed off on this and no children were hurt during this practical activity. But year two were studying the Great Fire of London. And the, the question they asked at the start was, why was the fire so bad? So of course, the best way to learn about that was to learn all of the key knowledge and facts around uh, that time period, around the construction of, of, of the Pudding Lane. But the best way to actually see that was to do it. So what they did was they built the houses, they constructed, reconstructed uh, Pudding Lane, and then they set it on fire. And they noted and observed the things that had happened during that. They noted the crosswind drawing the flames across the buildings. All of these sorts of observations stem from their questions. And that's inquiry-based learning at its purest. The picture on the top right here was from a series of lessons that was designed around escaping from a desert island, which culminated in building a raft. And of course, there's lots of learning involved in that. Uh, and you can build models of rafts, of course, and, and, and float them in a sink. But how much more real and authentic for students when they're actually in the rafts and they experience a sense of buoyancy and they know exactly what it feels like to either have a successful 
or an unsuccessful raft. But I think one of the most important things, uh, Daniel Willingham in his book about why kids hate school has a great quote and he says, memory is the residue of thought. And actually, if we want children to remember the things that we're teaching them, we have to ensure that they think really, really deeply about the content that we're presenting them with. So if I flick back to these examples, these children had to think really deeply about the construction of Pudding Lane and what the fire did with that. So we're hoping that that becomes a much more memorable experience. But of course, there's lots of other aspects of that uh, in terms of the, the specific VEAs and ACPs. And I'll exemplify some of these now. This is an example of a talk for writing cycle uh, in one of our year two classes where they've been reading the story Lost and Found. And at this point in the learning sequence, they're retelling the story with the story map. Now, of course, that's a form of recall and retrieval practice from what they've, they've done before. And it's really important that we define practice as a treat the retrieval and application of knowledge. And you can see that these children here are undertaking that intelligent practice so that they're internalizing and they will then be able to go on and construct their own story. So this is an example of practice and intelligent practice in action. I've got another example here of connection finding. And I think part of our job as high performance educators is to make explicit and model the specific VAs and ACPs that were, were eliciting at that time. So in this lesson here, uh, these year four children were uh, using Numicon and uh, abstract representations of fractions in order to be able to uh, construct unit fractions and then add those together. And of course, the connections between the Numicon pieces, the abstract representations of the digits, and then the quiz and error rods that they went on to construct further representations with is exactly the type of connection finding within learning that we can exemplify for them. This example here is from FS1, and uh, it's not a realistic representation of the teaching assistant, Mr. Hannah, from that classroom, but it is our representation. And what happened to you is the children had shown an interest in building towers uh, using Unifix cubes, and they were independently comparing the size of the towers. And then they started to develop that into comparing with their peers. And of course, this naturally led them into measuring who was taller and shorter. They decided that Mr. Hannah should be the benchmark for all things tall. He is a fairly tall person, as you can see from his representation. And they then started to measure themselves and place themselves on strings. Now, in terms of collaboration and fluent and flexible thinking, there's so much compromise uh, and, uh, and comparison going on there between the students. You see true collaboration in terms of their shared product, but you also see fluid and flexible thinking within the way that they have piggybacked off each other's ideas to reach an end point which could not have been anticipated from the start. This example here is from year six, and this demonstrates complex problem solving. This was part of an inquiry-based learning challenge where the children were investigating the structure of uh, Mayan pyramids. And in this example, you can see the, the boys uh, pointing to the, the special staircases that apparently were used for all sorts of gruesome things. But you can see here that the children have started with a question and they've then had to come up with a plan for the steps that they'll undertake in order to be successful in representing their Mayan pyramids here. And of course, that's a, a real example of complex and multi-step problem solving. But also the, the picture on the right in particular is it really demonstrates precision because when you see the quality of the work, that level of precision is absolutely uh, embedded there. But this example here that I've got is the last one that I'll share. Uh, and this is a, a story from a year five student. And one of the things that we do at Dog College is I, on my journey around school, I, I take pictures and take weekly highlights to celebrate with the students and staff. And this was an example that I picked out of year five writing. And rather than write the highlight for the student, they asked if they could write it themselves. And this is the words that she used to describe her, her, piece, of, her piece of work. She said, recently we looked at the book Tuesday and we wrote our own story related to it. The HPL skills that I used were fluent thinking, perseverance, and speed and accuracy. I find writing hard at points like spellings and punctuation errors, but if I could do all of that, I would be an even more accomplished writer than I already am. I think the HPL skills I used were fluent thinking, perseverance, and speed and accuracy. I think that I used fluent thinking because I had to create uh, new ideas for my writing. I also used perseverance because sometimes I wanted to give up. Actually, lots of times I wanted to give up. However, I didn't. And last but not least, speed and accuracy, because even though this was a Zoom lesson and it was hard to start, as soon as I got into a rhythm, I was uh, writing and writing and writing. And I think 
fundamentally in terms of high performance learning, that level of metacognitive awareness from our students, that understanding of the difficulties that they're facing in the learning, the strategies that they're using to overcome, and the processes that they've used to be successful is at its heart what high performance learning is all about. But where are we now? Because we are coming up now for a reaccreditation process. And what's changed since last time? So the things that have changed is we now undertake action research that's embedded within our schools and we use our teams to pose questions of themselves. And uh, fundamentally, what we're really doing with our action research is we're turning that lens of inquiry-based learning on our professional learning. We've also evolved our teaching and learning forums into teaching and learning podcasts, which we've shared across the school in order to overcome the barriers of the pandemic and not being able to get together. And of course, we've got those learning highlights in there that reflect the ACPs and DEs. But of course, digging deeper, it's about what comes next for us. And next up is our reaccreditation. And what's fantastic about that is there, hopefully, will be lots of validation of the work that we've undertaken. But the important part is there'll be things flagged up that we can develop further, and we'll be able to reflect and then act on that with the outcome of improving the educational experience for our students. We want to develop our vodcast and our highlights for wider audiences and explore our presence in, uh, in social media. But we also want to look at our systems for professional development, professional learning and quality assurance and turn the lens of high performance learning to them. Uh, we also want to make sure that our practice is informed by the current, most current research. Uh, I think there's that great aphorism in, in education. If you're not moving forward, you're, you're moving backwards. There's no neutral. And very much it's about staying on the cusp. But I think the really exciting thing is that we don't really know where the next three to five years will take us. Partnerships like Century Tech and High Performance Learning will hopefully enable us to uncover things that we haven't even thought of yet. And I think that's the really exciting part of our high performance learning journey. I'm, I'm going to stop now and uh, stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Shabi Bashir, who will take you through uh, our partnership with Century Tech. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Shabi, and I'm the uh, math fellow. I'm a mathematics teacher, and I'm also the uh, mathematics enrichment coordinator at Doe College. I'll be talking you through how we use Century Tech within the classroom from a personal point of view, and I'll be using examples of how Century has supported both myself and our students in mathematics. However, I'm sure you'll be able to see how these tools relate to your respective subjects. Um, I should also add that I've obscured and obfuscated some of the details in order to protect the identities of our students. I'll be linking our use of Century Tech to the HBL framework, which Chris gave an excellent exposition on just now. And this is so that hopefully you can see how everything fits together at Doe College. And I think one of the key links between HBL and Century Tech is that learning is personalized. And much of what Century serves to do is to help to make students more independent by taking ownership of their learning. Okay, so I'm going to begin by talking about Charlotte. Charlotte is a student to whom I taught a unit to on handling data. I set Charlotte a diagnostic assessment on handling data at the start of our work on this unit. A diagnostic is a set of questions that allows the artificially intelligent recommendation engine, which is a fancy way of saying AI, to determine what a student knows and doesn't know. Charlotte didn't get any feedback on whether she was responding correctly or incorrectly to the questions in the diagnostic, and she didn't see her overall score on the results page at the end either. This is actually a good thing because it meant that Charlotte didn't see it as a test. While she was completing the diagnostic, the AI was working uh, behind scenes, and it was trying to understand her strengths and areas for improvement. Anytime Charlotte clicked the I don't know button, Sentry worked to personalize the pathway with the appropriate nuggets. And I'll explain what a nugget is shortly. Looking at this, I think Charlotte probably clicked I don't know many times, as what you can now see are all of the suggestions that were made for her by Century. Each area came up as a button on her dashboard, which took her to a video and a slideshow that guided her through a lesson. And um, this learning was followed by a test of her knowledge in the form of a short assessment. And that's what we call a nugget. So as uh, Century is suggesting nuggets, I can also push them to a dashboard, and our suggestions are differentiated by that small grey logo to the left of the green icon. A student will always know from whom the nugget is being suggested, unless, like one of my students, they can't even log on to Sentry because they never write down their password. Anyway, back to Charlotte. Charlotte worked through these areas at home alongside her working lessons. I set her both formative and summative assessments, both on and off Sentry. 
Uh, meanwhile, Century continued to track her performance and her progress continued um, uh, to, to accelerate, um, as we were suggesting, uh, maybe it's to her as appropriate. So by working together, Century and I were able to ensure that Charlotte's knowledge wasn't circumscribed by our scheme of work uh, and my teaching, and we ensured that her web knowledge looked like the diagram uh, on the left rather than the one to the right. Um, and with respect to HPL, this combination of schoolwork and personalized learning helped Charlotte to find connections between the different subtopics, which in turn has improved her ability to generalize. Now, my doctor isn't someone who minces her words. And the last time she took a look at me, she advised that I buy a fitness tracker in order to take ownership of my health and to track my exercise routine. The detailed information that Century is providing us with is working in a similar way. The data you can see uh, on my screen here uh, belongs to Lena, who, well, judging by that graph in the bottom left hand corner, is probably taking a maths work a little too seriously. Uh, I talked Lena through how she could use the data Century was collating for her to monitor and track her progress. Uh, I also suggested that this would help her to take further ownership uh, of her learning as a target, uh, her personal target was to move up into our ISM. Uh, and she's been doing this in addition to her schoolwork. Uh, and again, no part, uh, in no small part due to her sort of uh, passionate input. Uh, she's actually a prime candidate uh, for that sort of higher set that she's looking to go into. The benefits of this are clear. Uh, I mean, I've been able to have informed conversations with Lena around how she's studying. Um, from this, we've helped to personalize her learning. Uh, Lena's also achieved greater ownership over her learning, and it's safe to say that she's improved on her ability to self-regulate too. Okay, so a detective is an investigator who collects information to solve crimes. Well, I too collect information, but my focus is on resolving barriers to learning, which unfortunately doesn't sound as cool. However, Sentry helps me to investigate my students' progress through vault class tracking. Uh, this gathering of evidence allows me to get a clear view of how a group will have performed on a particular task or no okay. um, I can also identify problem questions, which are questions that many students in the group might have struggled with. I also have the ability to see each student's individual evidence, uh, and this helps me to perform the inform the conversations I might have with them. So in this example, you can see that this student has missed uh, tasks. Uh, there's also some variations in their scores. So when I have a conversation with uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde here, uh, I'll be looking to identify the reasons for them. Again, there's lots of benefits to this. Uh, I mean, I can praise students accordingly. Um, also, the whole class analysis is detailed. It's time effective too. Um, and I can also use those problem questions to help inform my starter activity for the following lesson. And um, that's very useful in terms of strategy planning, even though that's uh, more for me rather than the students. And again, on some further investigative work. So here, I'm looking to identify misconceptions as centuries recording students' answers. Um, my initial reaction to seeing this, well, it should be executed. I uh, was to email Tom, the student, to begin a discussion on this misconception that I'd identified. So as Tom was learning from home uh, at the time due to the pandemic, uh, this was a particularly in effective intervention for me. Um, in other instances, uh, as Century recalls the time spent uh, per question as well, I can initiate conversations with students who may, let's say, spend a disproportionate amount of time on a single question to investigate why that might be. And personally, I think the best use of this is to find misconceptions in homework or home learning tasks, as I can do this much faster than in the traditional way of waiting for them to come back to school and then checking their homework from there. Okay, so one of the benefits of this investigative work is that it supports collaboration. Uh, and that's because for myself, Century and the student, well, we're all working together in tandem. Uh, another aim of those conversations that I might have with those students uh, would, uh, would center around how they can improve their metacognition. Now, I don't start off by telling them I'm trying to improve your metacognition because you might not take me seriously, okay? But what I do say is that, uh, you know, you can look to improve the way in which you approach, approach the next learning task. Um, you can also improve the skills and strategies uh, that you use ready for when you meet the next set of problems. Okay, uh, interventions. So in my opinion, I think this graph is incredibly useful as it helps to inform conversations that I have with students and parents as well. Uh, this graph is generated for each individual task, as well as for the group's overall performance. So, for example, if the student's learning from home, I've got immediate access to uh, this detailed analysis. 
Uh, and I'm sure you can imagine how long it would take a human to uh, make that graph. Also, I think the reason this is useful is because it helps to inform and support any decision I make on these strategies I might employ with students. So for example, uh, one of my students, Zach, completed a task from home on Century, uh, which then you know, automatically, uh, or well, almost automatically, identified him as someone who needed, needed stretch, as it were. Uh, so then later in the afternoon, while he was busy watching Netflix, he was pleasantly surprised when I sent him an email. An email from me directed him to some exam questions. Um, in another case, um, I could direct a student to a high level idea instead, uh, because that's uh, something I find is very good at helping students find connections between lower and higher level ideas. Okay. So whilst I'm sure Zach and his parents uh, were very impressed with how hard I was working, uh, checking through those uh, interventions and the intervention graph didn't actually take me long at all. Now, if you're someone who worries about technology replacing human beings, uh, now might be the time to look away. Century is essentially uh, constantly up updating a live feed of focus areas for students. Uh, this is very much like a teacher setting the summative assessment and then completing a test review. The only difference is this is happening after the completion of every individual task and it gets updated instantly. Uh, and what this does for our students is that it gives them a range of possible options to focus their attention on. Uh, for example, some students would, uh, some of our students look to their stretch areas because they want to maximize uh, an upcoming test score, or others might use it to focus on an area of weakness that you, know, you might want to revisit in order to understand it better. Uh, so in my conversations with students and parents on this, uh, uh, we sort of center around areas uh, that need to be prioritized and have discussions on when, when that needs to be. Uh, so, for example, if I know a student is moving on to a unit in the scheme of work, uh, an upcoming unit in the scheme of work, uh, and one of these topics here is an area of prior knowledge, I'd, invite, I'd, I'd advise that student um, that, hey, look, this is a sensible topic to uh, start working through. And even though the AI is processing information faster than I ever could, I'm using it to benefit the student. So even though all stakeholders are working collaboratively, uh, collaboratively, uh, Century is essentially working for me, well, for now at least. Okay, let's have a look at the, uh, my tracker function. So Century provides students, teachers, parents uh, with the list of their most recent and their best scores, as well as their completion rates for each task or nugget. And the most recent and best scores are handy when you, know, you want to have a look at um, how they're coping with, say, a topic they might have revisited. Uh, so in one sense, that would be helping them with their precision. Also, uh, the completion rates inform me as to how much of the nugget the student has completed. Uh, I find this tool very useful if I want to get an overview of their engagement with the tasks, say, over a period of time. Uh, also, for me, this tool has been very valuable in terms of building students' confidence, and I'll talk about that in my next example. Uh, one additional benefit of this uh, my tracker function is also that it's very helpful for parents. Uh, I met with one of my students, uh, Lily, and her mother last year. Uh, her mother, you know, essentially told me that uh, Lily was spending a lot of time in a room, uh, studying and doing extra revision, and mum wasn't really sure if the work Lily was doing was effective or not. Um, and you know, mum mentioned that she had a very demanding job. She didn't really have the time to oversee Lily's work every day. So one of my suggestions was that Lily should complete this uh, additional revision on Century, and then mum could view a tracker at the end of each week so that she could review it. And mum really liked the idea. Uh, to be honest, it, it you know, gave her a lot of peace of mind, and it gave her the uh, freedom to allow Lily to work unsupervised. And then we had follow-up conversations later on, you know, how Lily's work was coming along. Okay. So, um, it's my final example, um, and you know anyone who's made the terrible mistake of uh, reading 1984 by George Orwell, or Eric Arthur Blair, uh, will agree, I'm sure, that this next tool needs to be handled with a bit of care. Um, and, and again, I've put this in last just because it's a little bit of an advanced, uh, but sort of equally effective technique that I personally use Century for. So you can see here uh, the completion data that Century uh, uh, has given me, and it's obviously very highly detailed. Uh, and for instance, at the bottom of the screen there, you can see that one of my students has spent a grand total of six seconds on one of those slideshows. Um, and on that point, last year, uh, I worked with a student named Hannah, 
and I had low confidence uh, and, and low resilience, uh, uh, and, and I decided that the best thing I could do for Hannah was to build her confidence and resilience back up, which uh, I tried to do using uh, several strategies. But as you can imagine, it was quite challenging to track, uh, and it is quite challenging to track resilience and confidence levels, especially when tests are taken periodically. Um, and as you know, Hannah's test scores didn't really show any huge jumps. However, when we began to use Century, uh, I kept an eye on her completion rates uh, for all the tests and the nuggets. And I noticed uh, in sort of a, in slightly longer term, a sort of significant positive change in them. Um, you know, at no point did I discuss this with, with, with Hannah, uh, but it gave me the confidence to know that the way in which I was sort of discreetly trying to help her to improve her confidence was actually working. Um, option two um, would have been to you know, use this information in a sort of authoritarian way. Um, and you know, maybe give her a, a sort of a, a detention or something, uh, something like that for not completing every single task fully. Um, but you know, and in summary, I like to think that at your college, our interests are in imbuing students with positivity and in encouraging them. And what you know, what we don't want to do is imbue them with a sense of negativity and hostility towards the subject. Okay. And finally, here are some key facts on just how much Century Tech is used at our college. A, almost a third of our students use uh, has been accessed via the AI recommendations, which means they are uh, making personalized decisions on their pathways and they are self regulating as learners. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I will hand back now. Thank you very much, Shabi, and thank you, Chris, for uh, both of your presentations, your respective presentations. Really great insights, um, and, and great to take a back seat and actually just um, listen for, for once. I'm, I'm often the one presenting, so thank you for sharing, sharing those insights. Um, obviously, those of you in attendance today have heard um, the use of Century from a mathematical perspective, but just to highlight, uh, we do also have English and science content available from Key Stage 2 to Key Stage 4, so there are lots of cross-curricular links being made on that recommended pathway. Um, we have a few questions and not very long to answer questions, so I wonder if the panellists could just come off um, on, onto camera, sorry, so Shabby and, and, and Dr Stefan if you um, are there. Right, and um, we have a couple of questions that we'll, we'll go through. Um, maybe we'll start with Chris, actually, a, a question popped up around the, the uh, HPL framework from Claire, um, asking, um, uh, how did you track and measure against the HPL framework to ensure it's had a tangible impact in, and drove improvement across the school? And then stemming from that, what changes did you make to become uh, a world-class school? So Chris, maybe we'll start with you, but others feel free to chip in. It's a great question because fundamentally what we're doing doesn't have an impact on the outcomes for students. We shouldn't be doing it because our energy would be better spent elsewhere. So I think it's really important that uh, through the transitional process of implementing high performance learning, we've had really robust data points to track any improvements and outcomes for our students. And there's really, I guess, two key areas that we've tracked. One is about students' well-being, their understanding of themselves in terms of being able to articulate their well-being with the VEAs. And we've looked at using past survey data from that. And we've also looked at constructing our own well-being surveys so that we can track the implementation and articulation of those sorts of skills from our students. But the second part of that is about the quantifiable aspect and the tangible impact on uh, attainment for students. And of course, we've had uh, robust internal assessments, but also external validations through uh, partnerships with GL, with progress tests, and of course, examination results, it's results at certificate subjects in secondary school that validates a significant impact and if I may just be, uh, provide a small insight into that, the biggest impact that we have found is in the number of students who historically for us were not achieving year group expectations and moving those, those students into there. But more profound than that is the impact on the number of students who we get working at greater depth or mastering their curriculum now, because we're challenging children to think more deeply with the pedagogy of high performance learning, we're able to go to that greater depth I think the second part of the question, Claire, is, is a really interesting one as well, because we did make some quite profound changes to our teaching and learning. The most seismic shift for us was we were a school who had great results, but who had always set and streamed across our mathematics, for example, uh, across the primary school. When we reflected on the framework for high performance learning, and we think about the quote that I gave from Douglas Mall, what we felt was that from a philosophical perspective, we had to make changes there. So we shifted to whole class teaching 
rather than setting and streaming our students. And that was a really fundamental shift for us. I think the other shift was in bringing to the surface the explicit uh, modelling and uh, uh, sorry, the explicit modelling and noticing of specific advanced cognitive performance characteristics or values, attitudes and, att attitudes and attributes. It was about bringing that language to life and helping our children gain a greater awareness of themselves. That was quite a profound pedagogical shift for us. And I think, uh, you know, for example, uh, the, the, the average student at Doha College now, their metacognitive awareness of the process of learning is much more sophisticated than any school I've worked in before. And I think that's down to the high performance learning framework and its implementation. Fantastic. Thanks, and actually, John. Chris, while we have you on Spotlight, um, Michael Clark has come in with a, a question which naturally leads on from this. Have you managed to track students' journeys through the progression um, levels of the, the VAS, uh, an acronym that I'm not familiar with, but I'm sure you are? Yeah, absolutely. Again, it's a great question. Actually, as part of our journey, we haven't tracked individual student performance within VAs and ACPs. And I think we have quite good uh, thinking behind that, not to say that we do that out in the future. But of course, lots of the research in cognitive science just now is emphasising domain specificity in terms of cognitive skills, isn't it? So just because we say a child has uh, got great metacognitive awareness in maths doesn't mean that they have that within another domain. So actually, I think uh, the explicit modelling and development of those skills, for me, from my perspective, is more important than tracking specific attainment for students within those Fascinating. And, and Shabby, maybe if we could just move to you for a, a specific question around uh, Sentry. We have Kat coming in um, asking, how did you manage to embed Sentry into your teaching practice? Uh, did you use it in class or, or as a homework tool? And if I can maybe draw in another question from someone else, um, and I, I know you've touched upon this, but um, to what extent does, did autonomous learning or, or how was autonomous learning enhanced by Sentry Tech? So if you could try to cover some of those, that'd be fantastic, Shabby. All right, Charles, I'll do my best. Well, um, you know, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, and the way in which I personally prefer to use Sentry is to primarily inform um, my, my teaching and my planning um, within, as in physically within lessons. Um, generally, uh, what, I would, what I would do sort of prior to starting the unit would uh, really to be focusing on using the diagnostic uh, assessments. But again, uh, that would be... Uh, uh, after checking how long some of them are, because obviously you've got to make sure um, you know, that it doesn't monopolize the lesson, uh, if you like. But yeah, um, primarily uh, I, I use it as a supportive uh, sort of outside of lesson, if you like, tool, uh, because what that does is it, uh, it sort of acts like me when I'm not there. Um, you know, sort of I'm working with them in, in, within the, the classroom, um, I'm sort of covering and doing everything with them in here, and the moment they sort of um, and go off and, and, and sort of sat at home. It's kind of like, well, um, of course, you know, we have some uh, sort of very accomplished uh, parents here at the school, but, you know, not everyone understands how education works. So what Century is doing is it's kind of filling that void. It's sort of feeding back to me saying, okay, look, uh, this student has done this um, based on what, you know, what you taught them today or based on what you looked at this unit. This is what the student's doing. Uh, I'm going to send that information to you instantly. Uh, you can read that uh, at home. And then when you next see them, uh, you're informed, you know exactly what to talk to them about uh, and exactly how to take them forward. Um, and in terms of, uh, well, with respect to sort of autonomous learning, um, I, again, I won't go back to all those kind of individual examples there. Uh, hopefully that sort of short presentation I did gave you sort of a, a, an idea as to, okay, well, what is uh, Mr. Bashir here who's speaking on this Zoom call uh, actually telling me? He's telling me that, okay, of course, you're using this as a tool to solve uh, enhance their learning, but actually, uh, as in the examples, uh, some of the examples I gave earlier, uh, students are uh, sort of taking the uh, taking the uh, uh, the ownership uh, on themselves and saying, okay, well, um, I, I really enjoyed the work Mr. Bashir sent me, but uh, actually, oh, there's an area that Century suggested, or maybe I should cover that, or actually, I've got an upcoming test on on this particular topic, and Century sort of said that my understanding isn't too good on that, or maybe I'll cover that. Um, and like the, the student who wanted to move up into a higher set, um, students like that are looking at Century going, okay, um, tell me where my weaknesses are and I'm going to nail every single one of them. Uh, you know, don't stop me. Um, so, you know, there are so many ways in which 
uh, once I've sort of introduced Century uh, to those students, of course, there's, a, uh, there's kind of a handover. But once I've made that handover, I, I found anyway um, that a lot of my students, um, you know, sort of go on and uh, the majority of that kind of uh, working relationship is between them, as in outside of lessons, particularly in terms of autonomy, that, that relationship is between them and Century rather than me handing Century to them. Um, and, you know, that's that's been the case in the majority of uh, or with the majority of students that I've worked with, obviously, except for those uh, those couple that can't uh, can't ever write down their passwords and are always struggling to log in. Indeed. Well, thank you for so much. We're running out of time, and and so I'm just going to quickly cover a couple of basic questions, but we will follow up um, with answers. Uh, Masumi, you're asking about how um, you're ensuring students are, are progressing to the next level on Sentry, that the courses are naturally built to press and push students and the AI will help stretch and challenge your most able learners. Um, and please do get in touch with your account manager um, or your partnerships manager to, to learn more exactly how that works and, and, um, and how you can monitor that on your Markbook. Um, and I can see Amir has also asked about uh, professional development. Um, I'm sure it should be, and, and others at Doha College can attest to um, Century is very hands-on. And, and hopefully what you've taken away from this um, webinar is that we uh, work closely with the school throughout the year to help with continuous professional development um, to support you in the implementation of this solution. And um, there is no one size fits all model. You might be a school at a completely different stage to Doha College. That's fine. We work with you to understand your needs, to understand what it is you require next. Um, and we come up and tailor a strategy of, around that. And we then provide CPD throughout the year. Um, so yes, please do get in touch if you'd like to learn more about that. Um, uh, finally, I mean, there's quite a big question from Sunday about the advantages of grading students with classwork rather than final examinations. I'm not sure we're going to get a chance to unpick that today, unfortunately, but please do tune in for some of our uh, formative and summative assessment webinars. Uh, we've, we've got a bunch that have recorded with Tom Sharrington uh, and other people who can delve into that in, in much more depth than we have time for here. But thank you all so much. Uh, firstly, thank you to our panelists for, for coming here today and speaking to us. You've shared uh, a great insights. Um, there are contact details on the screen. If you'd like to get in touch and learn more about Century, I realize we're uh, quickly racing towards the end of the academic year. So I'm sure you're all thinking about your summer holidays and, and well-deserved break, um, but we are here and available if you'd like to speak to us. Um, and finally, a huge thank you to Chris, Shabby, and um, uh, Dr. Stefan and Luke from High Performance Learning. Thank you for coming here today and, and participating. Um, you can see from some of the comments in the chat that people have taken a huge amount from this. Uh, I think it's fantastic that we're able to, to put on the level of uh, the high quality level of CPD you know, webinars and insights uh, like this for free. So thank you all very much for your contribution. Have a great rest of the week and um, enjoy the rest of the term.